Here and welcome to The Hub, I'm Wang Guan in Beijing. The Boao Forum for Asia 2022 kicked off yesterday in China's Hainan province. Post-COVID economic recovery takes center stage as the world faces increasing uncertainties, especially with the resurgence of the COVID virus and the Russia-Ukraine conflict. President Xi Jinping of China delivered a much-awaited speech this morning via video link. To try to ease some of these concerns, he called for making Asia an anchor for world peace a powerhouse for global growth, and a new pace setter for international cooperation. He also proposed, he did actually a few years ago, a global security initiative, and he revisited this concept this morning. What to expect from the Boreal Forum for Asia this year? And can Asia kickstart the world economic recovery? To answer some of these questions, I'm very pleased to be joined this morning by Marcos Toijo, president of the New Development Bank based in Shanghai. Good morning, Marcos. Great to have you with us. Um, we've heard from the Chinese president this morning. Anything sticks out uh, for you? Hi, Guan. It's a pleasure to join the show again. Well, I think uh, if we take a look at the past uh, 75 years of global economic history, we will see that no matter what civilization you're coming from or what is the economic model that you embrace, but uh, if you think about countries like Germany, Japan, uh, China, Chile, uh, Spain since 1982, Singapore, uh, South Korea, all of these countries that have experienced extraordinary economic growth and, and a steady uh, pace towards prosperity. Globalization has been one of the driving forces. More global trade as a percentage of GDP, openness to foreign direct investments have been the pillars of economic success, success over the past seven and a half decades. And I don't see why, uh, say, the resurgence of the pandemic or geopolitical tensions or even global inflation that has picked up uh, in recent uh, uh, years should be uh, a way to uh, create an alternative to more globalization, to more uh, international cooperation, to increased flows of investment. So keeping the economy, the global economy open is to keep the global economy going. So if this message is broadcast mm -hmm. and embraced by countries even in difficult times, such as the one that we're living in, then I think we have a much better chance of achieving economic success. But Marcos, let's face it, many politicians, some scholars would point out that we're living in the real world where uh, you know, there is identity politics, where some people do lose out uh, amidst uh, globalization, uh, and they argue that the benefits of globalization goes to those very top, a very select few. Um, how would you address those concerns? I think, uh, once again, based upon recent economic experience, we can basically divide nations in two blocks. Those blocks of nations who have geared towards themselves, who have closed out to the global economy, who have pursued protectionist policies, who have become uh, nations that have become more insular, and their economic performance has been lagging behind. Whereas those countries that have opened up more to global trade, who have welcomed more foreign direct investments, who went out into the world to conquer global markets, have been much more successful. I think the risk of deglobalization today, as you said, is, is very high, but uh, I think it does not stand the test of time or the test of real uh, experience. I know that there's going to be a, a bigger uh, push towards, for example, regional economic integration. Some people say that the new fashion for globalization, which will be regionalization. But I think uh, common standards, common interests, uh, either at, under the umbrella of the WTO, or if you're talking about a new wave of multilateralism, where you, you come with things like, for example, uh, reduced access, uh, reduced tariffs, reduced quota, uh, common patterns for the exchanges. Once again, I understand that the, these common interests merging together via globalization are the most important tools for economic success. And even under the current difficulties, this trend will, is not going to change. And those who embraced a more of a protectionist approach, who close out, who have, will, will have less chances to become successful. All right, fair enough. Chinese President Xi, Xi Jinping actually called for making Asia an anchor for world peace, a powerhouse for global growth. How do you see that happening? 
Well, one, once again, I mean, if you if you compare Asia to other regions of the world over uh, over the past uh, three to four uh, decades, you will see that Asia has become indeed the geoeconomic meridian of of the globe. Uh, it's not only because of the early success of Japan and the success of South Korea, but now with the extraordinary economic performance of China over the past 30 to uh, 35 years years. You have uh, the bulk of global population here. It's it's the manufacturing hub of the world. And now with this evolution towards the fourth industrial revolution, you have many individual players among the nation states in the region who are also leading uh, the race towards, uh, for example, intellectual property, uh, tech intensiveness. And this may actually mean a very uh, uh, good uh, news for the rest of the world. I take, for example, the region where I'm from, which is Latin America. As Asia rises, some of the con traditional comparative advantages of Latin America stand out in the production of food, in the, pro in the production of, of, of those uh, uh, goods that are going to cater to uh, the, the rising uh, uh, population and the rising economic status for Asia. And that's why you see the levels of trade and the levels of investment going up among e regions like Asia and Latin America and even Asia in Africa, so I think it's 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 a it's actually a, 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 a good new, a good piece of yeah. news, and a piece of news that brings about more opportunities for other regions in the world. I mean, speaking of which, uh, I can tell you, many Chinese would say that they cannot get enough uh, of uh, Brazilian coffee beans or, or Brazilian Equatorian seafood, to say the least, among other things. Now, let's talk about your bank, the New Development Bank. It was formerly known as the BRICS Development Bank. Can you remind our viewers uh, the missions, the goals of your bank, and specifically what have you been doing over the years? Uh, some, maybe some of the concrete projects you have been doing uh, that is you know, aligning with these goals. Yeah, so I think when, when the leaders of the, of the BRICS nations uh, looked at the global economic picture, they said, well, uh, there is one piece that's missing out there, which is a development institution directed towards the needs of emerging uh, economies. So only uh, eight, nine years ago, having a development bank for emerging economies like the one we, we have right now was a faraway dream, but that dream has come true. The new development bank started operations in 2015, and almost seven years into this history, the uh, institution now features a portfolio book of projects of about $30 billion. We have more than 80 projects that span the four corners of the world in areas like uh, energy, water, uh, sanitation, the digital economy, urban mobility, uh, railways, uh, roads, airports. So basically every single uh, sector of infrastructure has been touched by the new uh, development bank. And it's not only about the amount of money that we mobilize and approve, but it's also the nature of the project, the kind of development impact they generate, how they change people's lives for uh, the better. So uh, we, we can consider the new development bank, even though recent times have been extraordinarily uh, challenging with you know the biggest economic crisis of the past 100 years, the biggest health-related crisis of the past 100 years, geopolitical tensions, although there, are, there is this environment, there is this atmosphere, which is very challenging. We have been able to, to, to make it through and we'll continue to do so. And then talking about development, sustainable development is, is a big part of it. Uh, how is the NBD, the NDB uh, actually, supporting the green economy and investments related to the environment and you know, social governance? Yeah, I think uh, we, should, we should approach the issue of the green economy from a very broad uh, perspective. So if you're, if you're, uh, if you're talking about improving the overall conditions of, of, of people. After all, the most important element of uh, sustainable development is, is the people. Uh, so if they, if they work in a cleaner environment, it have, if they have more access to water, if they are, if, if they are uh, say, equipped with, uh, with basic sanitation, even though these are not areas that directly relate, for example, to, to uh, what you could call a, a green economy, it ends up uh, creating a very positive uh, effect between the relation on the relationship between humans and uh, and uh, and urban development. Can you give us so an example so of the green development project for the next doing? five years? 
for the next five years. Oh, so about a, about a quarter that everything we investing is is directly related to the green economy. So solar energy, uh, wind energy, uh, mitigation, improving uh, uh, water treatment. Uh, adopting uh, new technologies that allow for low carbon emissions in urban transportation uh, in, in in Brazil, in China, uh, in India. So in, in different, uh, 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 say, member countries, we apply projects that are green. And going forward in the next cycle of five years, our strategy is to reach up to 40 percent of investments that are uh, somewhat related to, to the green economy. So we absolutely committed. It's part of our core mission to have sustainable development and the green economy as a direction to everything that we invest in. You know, Marcos, you know this better than I do. There are some uh, you know, skepticists, um, you know, naysayers about the merits of multilateral institutions, uh, banks included. And on top of that, we already have numerous multilateral banks ranging from the Asian Development Bank to the AIIB. Uh, what's unique about NDB? You know, Guan, in the uh, late 1990s, I worked at the United Nations in New York. I was posted at the, uh, uh, the mission of my country, Brazil, to the UN. And, and, and then you get confronted with, uh, with the difficulties of multilateralism, the different political interests, the different economic perspectives. Sometimes things are slow. Sometimes they're too bureaucratic. But at the end of the day, your conclusion is that all of the other alternatives to multilateralism are worse. Multilateral is the best equipment that you have to solve problems that are global in nature. And when you talk about, for example, the infrastructure needs of the emerging world, even if you put together all of the development banks, all of them combined, from, from the World Bank to the Asian Development Bank, the New Development, if you put them all them combined, they only count for about, uh, say, 5% of everything that the emerging uh, markets need in terms of infrastructure. So the more multilateral institutions you have there, the better. We're not in competition with each other. We're actually complementing each other. We're like different musicians in the same orchestra. The focus of the New Development Bank, of course, is infrastructure and sustainable development. So we are part of a, of a bigger family trying to address these problems. And of course, mobilization of resources is something that we contribute to the solution, but also ideas, uh, uh, projects, uh, the, the, the expertise that we have. We are a very lean uh, and, and agile uh, uh, institution. So the New Development Bank has a very important role to play in, in how the 21st global economy is being shaped. And finally, Marco, since you are in Boao, Hainan province, attending the Boao Asian Forum, let me ask you about the Boao Forum itself. How do you see the forum, you know, in not just pooling wisdoms and opinions and views, but in perhaps offering more concrete action plans uh, to address some of these pressing issues we're facing? Yeah, I mean, if, if, you, were, if you were to sort of scan some of the problems that we have uh, today, Guan, like you have an increase in monetary supply that leads to inflation, you have an increase in international protectionism, that leads to, uh, say, uh, uh, economic performance that is far from optimal. You have an increase in geopolitical tensions, but you have a decrease in international cooperation. So what the what the Boal Forum is, is is great for is having people from all over the world come together. So cooperation is there, collaboration is there, and it's because you're bringing those different perspectives together is that concrete actions may actually be thought of and implemented going forward. So it's a very important tool for economic recovery and for better understanding, which is at the core of uh, how multilateralism and international cooperation should play out. Marcos Tlaijo, president of the New Development Bank. Thank you so much for joining us. Great to pick your mind. My pleasure, Guan. Thank you so much. Great. You've been watching The Hub on CGTN with me, Wang Guan.